Good evening. Good evening. Hey, good. I wasn't expecting a response, <laughs> but thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jayati Murthy. I'm Dean of Engineering here at UCLA, and I want to welcome you all to our Ronald and Valerie Sugar Distinguished Speaker Series. Um, we're doing it a bit differently this time. We typically have individual speakers, but we got a panel today which I think is going to be absolutely phenomenal. Before we launch into this, I want to say a few words about the series itself. Uh, the series is, uh, has been endowed by Ronald and Valerie Sugar. Uh, Ron Sugar is a graduate of our school, in fact, a triple Bruin, uh, BS, MS, PhD. Uh, some of you will know him as uh, the retired CEO of Northrop Grumman. Uh, currently serves as the ch uh, chairman of the board at Uber. And so he is really one of our truly distinguished uh, alumni. And so he and his wife, Valerie, uh, set up this Distinguished Speaker Series to bring luminaries like our panelists today to campus to speak to our students and to expose them to this big world of ideas and engineering uh, that's really out there. So I'm uh, so grateful to them. Uh, for their philanthropy and for all that uh, they and our alumni are doing uh, to help our students out. So philanthropic support uh, supports scholarships, it supports graduate fellowships, research. It's absolutely critical for the things that we're able to do in our school. Today's topic is seismic re uh, resilience progress and preparedness in Los Angeles. And I don't have to tell you how critical uh, the topic is. Uh, so when, I don't know about you guys, but when earthquakes happen, my first instinct is to run. Of course, we're not supposed to do that. You, <laughs> you know, drop cover and hold. But these folks here, uh, not only do they drop cover and hold, their first instinct is to run towards the earthquake to go get data, which is <laughs> entirely counterintuitive. So I know I don't have what it takes to be an earthquake engineer. Uh, and uh, so they are doing something truly important. Uh, earthquakes are a fact of life in California, and it is really these folks' work that's improving uh, the resilience of our infrastructure, the depth of our understanding about these phenomena, and you know how life critical it is in a big city like LA. So uh, I want to start off by introducing our speakers one by one. Uh, so. First on my list is uh, Craig Davis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a fan following yeah, here, I see. Fan club. You, you're one of these earthquake stars. <laughs> 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 so he is a professional consultant on geotechnical earthquake and lifeline infrastructure systems. Uh, he spent more than 31 years at the LA uh, Department of Water and Power managing multi-million dollar projects, developing its comprehensive resiliency programs. He participates in many national and international professional committees, and he received ASCE's Laval Lund uh, Award for practicing lifeline risk reduction. He holds a PhD, but from USC. Is that right? <laughs> That's why I just wore the gold today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you for that. Um, the next on my list here is uh, Christine Goulet. She is the executive Small director. <laughs> <laughs> she is the executive director for applied science at the Southern California Earthquake Center. She is the center's science lead and technical integrator for large-scale collaborative projects that involve diverse disciplines related to earthquake hazard and risk. Her research interests are in geotechnical and earthquake engineering and applied seismology. She earned her master's and PhD in civil engineering from UCLA, and her advisor was John Stewart. <laughs> Glad to see you both here. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, next on my list is uh, Ken Hardnett. He is the science advisor for risk reduction <laughs> and a research geophysicist in the US Geological Survey. He ensures that USGS uh, hazard standards are being applied to help solve societally relevant problems. Uh, his honors include uh, the Ivan I. Muller Award for Distinguished Service and Leadership from the American Geophysical Union and the Meritorious Service Award from the US Department of the Interior. He is a visiting associate in geophysics at Caltech 
and a lecturer in our UCLA civil, engineer, civil and environmental engineering program, and his PhD is from Columbia. Uh, I want to also introduce uh, Gary Lee Moore. <laughs> <laughs> he is the city engineer for the city of Los Angeles. He oversees an organization of more than a thousand engineers, architects, surveyors, and support staff. Since being named city engineer in 2003, uh, Gary's overseen the completion of some 1,700 projects totaling more than $6 billion. He has spent uh, more than 35, 34 years of public service, recognized as a leader in sustainability practices in design and construction of LA projects, and he serves on a number of civic and professional boards. He's also one of ours. He's a UCLA Samuel Lee graduate uh, in 1985. Right, and uh, I've got next uh, Professor John Stewart. Uh, he, is, he is professor and he was of course the chair of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering here at UCLA. Uh, his research is in geotechnical earthquake engineering and engineering seismology. He's received many, many honors for teaching and research, including a few here that I'll mention. Uh, the UCLA Distinguished Teaching Award. This is a campus level award recognizing our best teachers. Uh, he won the Bruce Bolt Medal, a joint award from three scientific communities, societies rather, for leadership in the transfer of scientific and engineering knowledge into practice and policy. He received his PhD from UC Berkeley, joined our faculty in 1996, and he is the advisor or co-advisor to more than 30 PhD graduates. Um, and finally, I've got our program moderator, uh, Professor Ertegro uh, Tassaroglu, or ET as he is called. <laughs> as you know, he is professor and chair of our UCLA Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. Uh, ET's research is in computational solid and structural mechanics, and he's currently leading projects on soil structure interactions and the performance of seismic assessments. He is a fellow of the ASCE, Engineering Mechanics Institute, and he received the ASCE's Walter Huber Research Prize. His PhD is from Illinois, and he's been a member of our faculty since 2001. So let me hand this off to ET. Uh, this time around, I get to sit in the audience, which is phenomenal. I really intend to enjoy every single minute, as I'm sure you do. So here's to a wonderful evening. Well, thank you, Jathi. And uh, thanks uh, to all of you, our alumni, our colleagues, our students, uh, for showing up here tonight to listen to our distinguished uh, panelists on this important topic. Um, I see many earthquake experts among the audience, but our audience is not just comprising earthquake engineers, it's much broader than that. So we decided to keep uh, an eye on the big picture rather than drilling down on some of the technical details. So this discussion is just going to touch upon the important uh, elements of seismic resiliency of our city with a, perhaps a broader outlook on the seismic resiliency of the entire state of California. Uh, so what I did to prepare for this uh, panel is I solicited some questions, I put them on paper, but I thought it would be better to have some visual aids to go along with these questions, so I solicited some slides from our distinguished panelists and I combined them. So what I will do is I'm going to kind of present each of these questions and pose them to, well, one of the panelists to begin with, and then uh, we're going to take it like that and we're going to roll over different questions. So. Uh, the makeup of the panel, the, the, the slides are going to be basically threefold. We're going to have a retrospective look at the past. Um, what have we learned from past earthquakes? What happened in the past? And then maybe look at the present. What, we, what is our current exposure to seismic hazards? And then maybe something uh, looking forward. What, what are we going to do now to ensure the, uh, the economic and uh, sort of seismic safety of Los Angeles and California in general. So with that, let me begin by moving to our first slide, assuming that this will work. And it did. <laughs> and move to the, 
um, the, the first question. So as I was mentioning, uh, my idea was to kind of have a retrospective look in the beginning. And in the slides you're seeing in front of you, these are photographs from the 1971 San Fernando earthquake, which has been a, a devastating earthquake uh, in the history of California. And that happened and we have learned uh, uh, from the mistakes we have made as engineers from that event. And then uh, we had other events like 1994 Northridge earthquake. And again, uh, our structures were not completely safe. And most recently, uh, we have uh, the Ridgecrest earthquake, which happened in a rather, rather rural area. So we didn't have a lot of exposure of our infrastructure. But I think we are drawing great lessons from that recent earthquake as well. And we're going to be touching upon those. So my first question then is uh, the obvious question. What do we mean by seismic resiliency? And how do we measure that? So let me pose that first question to Craig Davis. OK. So I get to bore you first. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with something a little rigid, but then I'm going to lighten it up a little bit, if that's all right. So there, there are some definitions of what resilience is. And um, uh, let me explain one of those. It comes from uh, Presidential Policy Directive 21 that says that resilience is the ability to prepare for and adapt to changing conditions and to withstand and recover rapidly from disruptions. Resilience includes the ability to withstand and recover from deliberate attacks, accidents, or naturally occurring threats or incidents, which would include earthquakes. But I didn't know how to implement that. I didn't understand that, really. From, from a practical perspective, being asked to implement resilience for the LA Department of Water and Power, I couldn't get anybody to do anything with that. So I made my own definition, which seems to work. So a resilient infrastructure system, so now we're talking about infrastructure resilience, is a network designed and constructed to accommodate hazard-related damage with the ability to continue providing services or limit service outage times tolerable to community recovery efforts. I mean, get the water to the people when you need to or get the roads working when they need them. Um, so we should be able to design things for that. So the hazard-related damage in this case would be earthquake-related damage. But really, what does it mean? It's the resilience is the recognition that we can't be earthquake-resistant. We, in a major event, we can't prevent damage. We can't prevent the losses of service, whether it's from the infrastructure systems or the social systems, uh, the medical systems. We can't prevent that. But it's a belief that we can design systems to be able to provide the services to the community when they need them. So you will lose water, which is, is the, the, these plots here are about water, and I'll explain in just a second, after a major event. The Department of Water and Power wants you to know this. We can't prevent that. So you should be prepared to expect a loss of water when you get affected by the Northridge earthquake, which is the, the diagram here. What, what I'm showing is the restoration of water. So we lost water to 3 quarters of a million people in 1994 in about 10 seconds. That's larger than most cities. But that water system was highly resilient. They restored water. It wasn't potable, didn't meet water quality regulations within seven days. Everybody had water. They could flush their toilets, for example. They could water their lawns. Within 12 days, less than two weeks, everybody had potable water so that they could, they, they could use it just like it was normal. But how do you de measure resilience is the next question, right? Is that on there? Yeah, and how do you measure it? So people want to measure, in, in the research world is where resilience came from, they want to measure it related to this idea of functionality, which becomes very confusing to me and I would assume if I try to explain what functionality is of, of urban systems, it might be very confusing to you. But it is easier to understand if you relate how the services are provided before, right? So we have 100%, nearly 100% of water services at any given day. We have an earthquake. We lose a certain amount of water services. And how do we restore those water services relative to pre-earthquake conditions, so hopefully at 100%. If we can't restore it to 100%, then we're going to lose this number of people. Right? So the idea is how do you get these services back so that the people don't leave, that we can maintain some level of similarity to what we had before the event. That's the goal uh, of resilience. Although we can't always meet that. Think of Pompeii after Mount Vesuvius. It was 100% gone. Hopefully we don't get anything like that in Los Angeles. <laughs> But we have things like the Northridge earthquake. We'll hear more about the San Andreas event. Uh, and we don't want to lose people because of loss of services or damage to infrastructure. 
because of a major event, because as engineers and as the society as a whole, we can prevent that. So that's the idea of resilience. So you had also provided me a second slide on the San Andreas Fault earthquake example, but <coughs> that is for future planning, I suppose. Yes, yes. That is. So um, my next question is to, to Gary. Uh, what can we do to prepare for earthquakes as individuals? Before I answer that question, I had this dream last night that I was on a panel with five PhDs, and there was me. So uh, there had to, so. Uh, it what was not do? a nightmare. It <laughs> wasn't. I, it, no. it, so it's uh, first of all, it's great to be here this evening. Uh, you know, we hear it all the time, uh, but I, I do uh, recommend uh, the Shake Alert LA. Any time you can download that on your phone, get a few minutes more. Uh, in case of an earthquake, so I definitely want to promote that. And then you've got to do the things that we're supposed to do. As you heard uh, Craig say, uh, water may not be there, and you've got to have that water storage. You've got to have that earthquake uh, uh, kit available. Make sure you have that contact outside of the area. Uh, it, I know it seems really simple, but you, we need to be prepared at all times. And then, of course, in your own home, uh, if you haven't moved recently, obviously with all the codes that we have now, your homes are inspected uh, upon sale. But it's really important, as you can see on the screen here, you know, the basics of the water heater and et cetera. So it's really important to, do, to be as simple as it sounds and to be prepared. I'd like to add to that. There's a, there's a website I really like for this. Uh, the Earthquake Country Alliance developed the seven uh, steps to earthquake safety. And that's defined in addition to what Gary presented here at uh, earthquakecountry.org, earthquakecountry.org. And there's a lot of things on preparedness, but also what to do during the event and so on. And I think uh, there's a, th these rules are for people to implement, so it's very well done. Yeah, I guess uh, it's one thing to survive an earthquake, and it's another thing to survive the aftermath. I put a photograph from uh, 1994 uh, uh, Northridge damaged uh, house, which was in that particular shape for at least six months. So that's the reality of an earthquake, I guess, in an urban setting. So just to make sure everybody understands, one of the main reasons that single family homes fail is because they're not bolted to their foundation. Mm -hmm. And you'd be surprised how many uh, homes still in California have not been bolted to their foundation. That happened to this one here. So if your house is, uh, was constructed before about the 1960s or so, and you don't know, you'd better check it out. Go in the crawl space. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a fairly inexpensive retrofit. A few thousand dollars usually, they're specialty contractors. You do that, the odds are your house will survive the earthquake. The other thing that people should do that's very low cost is a gas shutoff valve. Uh, a, a simple gas shutoff valve, it's usually a little ball on a pedestal that simply falls into the supply line. <clears throat> that way, if a gas line ruptures on your property, it won't ignite a fire. Simple thing, could save your house. And so, if you live in a single family home, I would urge you to do these things before the earthquake. So, what do we do when it happens, um, while it's happening? What are the best things to do? So there's, there's a lot a of question to Christine. different <laughs> rumors and so on, but the drop, cover, and hold on. But what does it mean? It starts shaking, you feel it, you drop low to the ground so you don't fall, okay? You cover, it doesn't mean you do this. You cover your head and neck, you use your whole arm. If you can, you go under a sturdy desk, and then you hold on. Why do you hold on? Because the desk might move differently from you and you lose your protection. So the idea is really to protect yourself, protect your most vulnerable parts, so the, the neck and the, and, the, and the head. And then if you have a disability and you're in a wheelchair or you have a walker or you have a specific condition, there's a lot of uh, adjustments to these recommendations that exist. If you go to shakeout.org, <laughs> there's uh, different cases on what to do in your specific situation. There's also videos of what to do if you're in a car. But the rule of thumb is really drop cover and hold on. Don't try to run out of a building. Um, and and uh, door frames, 
it used to make sense when the houses were just brick and that's the only thing that stood afterwards. It's not a safe place to be and oftentimes the door can hit you and injure you more than anything. And let's look around here, how many door frames, how many people? I mean, only the, the fittest <laughs> will win <laughs> and all of us will trample each other. So, and if you try to run out of a structure, it's much more dangerous. You can have uh, bricks or uh, window panels fall over you. So drop cover and hold on. And if you're already outside, stay away from the face of buildings and so on and stay in the clear. But that's really the best recommendation. Of course, I do differently sometimes because we think about this and I know where I'm at. And it's, but drop cover and hold on is the best thing to do. So I was trying to find out whether we uh, do what we preach, and I found a, a photograph <laughs> where uh, somebody took a picture of Ken during the Ridgecrest earthquake. He's holding on, too. He's doing all yeah. perfect. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I was going to say in that last slide, the uh, drop cover hold on, the hold on is the third panel of the icon, and a traffic light was in front of it, so you couldn't see it said hold on on the third panel. But yeah, um, yeah. so you see what I mean. and. Here in this example, what happened is uh, the gear team led by John and a group of us, Christine, Craig, uh, went up after the magnitude 6.4 to Ridgecrest. So we happened to be all in this room together having a meeting of the California Earthquake Clearing House. And first, uh, there was a foreshock. It was, I think, a 5.8, yeah. something like yeah. that. And so we all did drop cover, hold on. We got up and we were kind of nervous laughter, you know, we resumed our conference call and our meeting, and then the main shock hit, and it was a, quite a wild ride. And so fortunately, we had all just practiced drop cover hold on right there. And then this is during the main shock, my, my colleague Ben Brooks, I don't know how he thought to take a picture while this was <laughs> happening. But yeah, you can see I'm, I'm, sorry, I should point up here. I'm grabbing the leg of the table, and it's just like Christine just said, you want to drop cover and hold on because, as she said, the furniture may move away and not be protecting you anymore. And in this case, I learned firsthand why, you know, we were all basically, uh, you know, we were in the process right there of being traumatized. This was by far the strongest shaking I ever experienced right in this picture. And I experienced Northridge too, uh, but this was much stronger. So good idea to drop cover and hold on. Yeah. I was just going to add, uh, Los Angeles City Hall is base isolated, and uh, after we did the base isolation, I was there, and an earthquake happened, and we did what we were supposed to do, drop, cover, and hold, but I was smiling. I, I was so excited to finally be in a base isolated building during an earthquake, so uh, it, was, it was a good ride, but it, was, it, it moves, but it, no damage, so yeah, it was quite, uh, quite the ride. Should have moved slowly. Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> I mean, my personal experience is that I couldn't keep a cool head. I actually ran out, tried to run out of the building in 1999, <laughs> back in the day. It's, it's not, yeah, it's not always possible. Um, so um, my next question is to, to Craig again. What are the natural hazards that pose the greatest threats to California? Obviously, it's not just earthquakes. We have more frequent events that are plaguing our state. Right. Yeah, so as shown on the screen, earthquakes, uh, which is a pretty big deal across the state. Everybody ex has a high exposure in the state. But uh, fire, which maybe, I'm an earthquake engineer, but I've become more concerned about the hazard to the state, uh, especially Southern California, uh, Northern Cal, well, and it's not just especially, it's all of California. Uh, we're losing a lot uh, from fires every year. So that's becoming a, a huge issue. Flooding, as you see in the example there, photo, uh, flooding's a big deal and we haven't seen uh, in near recent times some historic floods that this state have actually experienced. But there's also volcanoes. How many of you have seen the movie? <laughs> <laughs> they called the DWP if you saw the movie, right? To stay from the volcano. But we, we don't have them here in Southern California, but we do in Northern California. And for those of you who do live in the city of LA, you do have an exposure of your water supply to a fairly significant volcano. So the city can be directly affected by volcanoes by, uh, through the water and the power systems. Uh, but those, those are the ones that I'd say we need to pay most attention to, but there are other things like tsunami can affect certain areas 
as well across the state. So is it sort of fair to say that uh, whatever we're learning about, you know, signs of resilient systems uh, based on our investigations and research on earthquakes, do they sort of apply to other hazards as well? Can we characterize a resilient uh, mm -hmm. resiliency of a you can. community against uh, other hazards using similar methodologies? And yes, yes, uh, I've been engaged in a lot of that. So. As an example, I would write some very detailed reports about uh, the LA water system, about earthquakes, and then I would start explaining those to other people and uh, in conversation I would think, well, this applies. So I literally have published a lot of papers by taking the DWP reports and word searching earthquake to, and changing it to hazard and changing water to lifeline system, and it almost exactly applies. Uh, there's very few changes, so maybe not all water systems across the San Andreas, so I would have to edit those things out, but it's, it's interesting how they apply. And so you can go study and research the effects of a fire and actually understand how it might affect uh, a water system after an earthquake, as an example. So in Santa Rosa, as an example, they use plastic pipes. The fire's so hot that it created a water quality concern and melted some of their pipes that affected parts of the city that were not directly affected by the fire. So again, you're, you have a loss of water service. And, and so then you can see the impacts to the community in trying to recover, which are then applicable you know, from hazard to hazard. So there, there's a tremendous amount of applicability by looking at the multi-hazard regime to understand how different effects. So earthquakes actually lead the way in these research areas, uh, helping other hazard experts understand uh, infrastructure and so on. So th there's a lot of cross-pollination in that. There's a, one thing that we, we tend to forget, maybe especially the general public, is that there's often triggering of hazard and cascading failures. You have an earthquake, it breaks your uh, gas uh, pipe, it ignites, you have a fire, your water mains are damaged. So you had all those things that can pile up. I, I don't want to be like uh, alarmist here, but these things have happened in the past. And for a lot of the people, the, the 1906 San, uh, San Francisco earthquake was known as the great fire of San Francisco. There was also some kind of trying to hide the fact that it was an earthquake, but an earthquake can trigger fires too, and then it just multiplies the issue, so all those those things right. become related. As well as landslides, landslides and other things that you might get exactly. on their own. Yeah. So let's drill a little bit deeper on this uh, and look at the second question. So let me just pose this question to Jonathan. Uh, how does the risk from earthquakes compare to other hazards? Yes, relative levels of risk. Um, I think the first point I would make in connection with that is um, our ability to assess risk and the way that it is sort of rolled out and accounted for in practice is much more developed in the earthquake area than it is in these other areas, uh, especially with regard to, to fire. And I would say probably with landslides that applies as well. Um, now, given the limitations we have in certain areas, nonetheless, what are the relative levels of risk? Like most good questions, the answer is it depends. <laughs> um, if we're talking about, for example, water infrastructure, as we've heard on the panel so far, um, I would argue that if you take dams, for example, uh, earthquakes are the dominant hazard for dams. Uh, and then you have the, uh, the aqueducts and the pipeline systems that distribute the water uh, throughout the state. Um, again, the earth earthquakes are gonna be the dominant hazard. And this has been looked at by various agencies, uh, some of which I've consulted with. Uh, there are various hazards, but the main driver of the risk in the water system is earthquake. On the other hand, suppose you are a uh, community in the urban wildlife, uh, wildland interface, a place like uh, Paradise or many other communities uh, throughout California in the foothills. Uh, I think what we're seeing now is pretty clearly uh, fire is emerging as the major threat to life and to the wooden structures in those places. And that's where, uh, you know, we have a real gap. I mean, we, we have not done nearly as much research and we don't have nearly the tools to assess the risk and to design structures to be resistant to that. So I think there's a tremendous need for some of the lessons we've learned in earthquake in terms of hazard characterization and designing structures to be resistant um, to roll out those lessons with these other hazards. So earthquakes are the dominant hazard in California, but these other things are coming up and in certain domains, certain parts of the state, certain types of infrastructure, 
uh, we can't ignore these other hazards. And uh, it's, it, with climate change, it's, it's a very, very serious matter, as we've all seen. Well, going back to er earthquakes, uh, so did I go too fast? Well, um, may I show this one thing yeah, um, before we move on? So uh, the chief resilience officer of Los Angeles, Marissa Ajo, worked for the mayor over a couple of years' time, and um, they produced this report, which is also available electronically online. So the city of Los Angeles has a resilience program. This resilient Los Angeles looks at the multi-hazard threats matrix for Los Angeles, and it um, also points out the important distinction between shocks and um, long-term chronic stresses. Mm -hmm. So it does talk about things like uh, long-term over decades, changes in terms of climate change and uh, warming, but also changes in snowpack that are anticipated and the challenges that'll be presented to the water systems from those long-term stresses. So it's a really good resource. Um, I just wanted to point that out, that Los Angeles has put a lot of thought and effort into this, uh, not just the city, but also the county. And they have another important thing to mention is that they um, have what are called local hazard mitigation plans, which are also looking at the multi-hazards threats. So they've done planning and careful consideration, and that is actually one of the good ways to be resilient is to just think through what might happen. You know, use scenarios, use probabilistic approaches, but all of that, a lot of that is contained right here. I don't mean to say it's a solved problem, it's certainly yeah. not, but this helps. Yeah, I think that's very encouraging. I mean, I, just as a citizen, I personally feel like some of the more frequent hazards like fires will sometimes take the center stage. And our hazard resilience is generally sort of provided by policy, by the government. They'll set the standards and you know, uh, action is taken. And if the government is focusing on fires too much and then omit the, the less frequent uh, hazard of earthquakes, we may be not sort of making ourselves completely safe. But these uh, sort of integrated studies where multiple hazards are actually considered is extremely valuable. I, I should have mentioned that the, the sort of, in a way, the, the sad punchline to this imp incredible document is Marissa uh, did such a good job that Houston hired her away from us. <laughs> uh, so of course they were hit by the hurricane. And so they're in a different phase now where they've received a tremendous amount of uh, funding to help recover from the hurricane damage. So she's gone to Houston to help them with that process. But we do have Aaron Gross. Yes. As the chief resilience officer to carry on the legacy. So I guess uh, one of the ways that we kind of uh, immunize our, ourselves against diseases is to get shots and um, you know that brings me to Ridgecrest. Ridgecrest happened recently in a rural area where we don't have a lot of people uh, or infrastructure. Uh, so I'd like to sort of pass the baton to you, uh, Ken, to talk about that earthquake a little bit to see what kind of lessons we can draw from that okay. event. Would it be okay if I try the yeah. pointer? Please go ahead. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, well, so uh, not much infrastructure. The city of Ridgecrest is um, under 30,000 people, uh, but just about everyone there is in some way uh, tied to the Navy base. It's a, it's a very important Navy base called China Lake. And so uh, they did sustain damage there, significant damage. And uh, the gear team members, John, Christine, Craig, uh, were out there looking at the actual damage that they documented then. And so there were some very important um, lessons learned, I think, about damage. Ridgecrest, is, um, its population growth was relatively recent, and so a lot of the construction was to, relatively speaking, newer codes. And so things like what we saw in the South Napa earthquake, a lot of unreinforced masonry chimney damage, that was less of a problem in the Ridgecrest. Ridgecrest did have a number of mobile homes shift off of their um, bases. That's, so there were a lot of things where we've already learned those lessons repeatedly in California hot water heaters coming off, all that stuff. We know all of that, um, but if people don't take the action to strap their water heater or, you know, these are some pretty basic things. Um, but let's see, so this earthquake sequence got started on the 4th of July uh, with the 6.4, and then, let's see this one, okay. And then uh, about 34 hours later was the 7.1, which is when we were in the meeting and covering hold. Um, 
So this just gives some stats on how many aftershocks, and there have been so many. Um, you can see the numbers here. I won't recite those, but uh, one of the things that I'm excited about in terms of the technology is USGS, in partnership with Caltech, we monitor all the earthquakes in Southern California. And there's operational mode location of uh, earthquake activity, and our automated systems did really well keeping up with all these aftershocks. But also what's exciting is that there's a new method being used uh, called template matching that lets you extract much more information from the waveforms that we're recording. So we're getting a much more detailed picture of the fault system when we look at these uh, aftershocks. They're lighting up a whole myriad complex uh, set of faults. There was a recent science paper by Ross and others that showed that over 24 faults were responsible for this earthquake sequence. Mm -hmm. It's pretty incredible. Now let's see if I want to advance. I'll go like that. There. Okay, so here you see the, the fault system. The 6.4 generally was on this, um, well, it started with some rupture on this fault plane here. This is the epicenter of the 6.4. And then just moments later, it continued with some cascading rupture on this fault, part of this fault plane, and then it broke this whole thing. Um, now, several of us went out immediately after the 6.4, as I mentioned, and we did aerial reconnaissance on the day of the 5th, and we saw surface fault rupture along much of this. Janice Hernandez from CGS and I were up in the helicopter with CHP and made those observations. Um, we, we then, we came in and that evening we briefed the Navy and the city and told them this is what we had found and we talked about the 1987 Superstition Hills sequence where we had seen cross fault triggering, fault interaction. So we kind of in a way gave them a heads up that something else might be brewing and then sure enough, about a couple hours after we gave those briefings, the 7.1 occurred on this fault so what we were talking about was how this fault is what we call left lateral. So it would uh, decompress this portion of the main fault that we knew was there. And so we said, well, you know, this happened in 1987. It might happen again. We don't know when or how big that next earthquake might be. But we have seen sequences where first a cross fault broke and then a main fault. So fortunately, we had um, just briefed them and given that, them that caution. And then when the 7.1 happened, it ruptured toward the northwest up into the airport late fault zone and then also toward the southeast. And so um, that was a very complex <coughs> rupture. And you can see that complexity from this figure. Um, now, looking at it from the air, these are just some, I hope, uh, photos that help appreciate what this rupture looked like. So here we're um, looking down on it in Google Earth, and these red dots are places where we measured large <laughs> slip along the fault. Every one of these red dots is at a place where there's a little offset channel that's been offset by more than two and a half meters, and in some cases, more than four meters. So when we're looking toward the northwest from, whoops, uh, we, we look toward the northwest, we see this. It's, uh, we're looking right down the fault. So even though it looks pretty straight when we look from above, here we're looking from here toward the northwest, and you can really see how it's not perfectly straight. It, um, it has really interesting angling, angular rupture. And then looking from here toward the southeast, this is the view we have. Um, this is the same hill in the foreground of each of these photos, but one, the left one is looking toward the northwest, the right looking toward the southeast. So the geologists were out there mapping the fault rupture and looking for features like this one. So the person in the orange shirt is at the uphill side of a little channel that's only about 20 or 30 centimeters deep. And right where his feet are, and he's holding the tape measure, is where that channel would project into the fault plane. And this is the fault coming through. And this other geologist is holding the other end of the tape measure where that projection of that channel goes on the other side of the fault. So you can see how long that tape is that they're pulling. It's about a 15 foot offset at this location. So that's the kind of geological evidence that we're documenting in the field out there. <coughs> Here's a dirt road that's been offset right laterally that you can see here. So this dirt road had been straight before the earthquake and the fault rupture is coming through here, nicely lit by the low sun angle there. And uh, we did see some evidence, very limited evidence of liquefaction sand boils like this one. Um, and then this is the final slide from the Ridgecrest uh, fault rupture investigations, but just a nice shot from the <coughs> air. Here's the fault coming through. 
and this portion of the stream dry channel had been straight. You see I've used a red dashed line to indicate here to here. That's the offset, and these arrows are indicating the sense of displacement on the fault, the right lateral strike slip fault. Um, so that was just a quick run through of uh, some of the field investigation results. Yeah, so uh, I am personally working on uh, some simulations where we are trying to put a virtual city on top of Ridgecrest and see if there was a city there, what would happen to it. Mm -hmm. And kind of this kind of picture also brings to mind uh, the fact that we are in Los Angeles. Our water comes from someplace else. And between that someplace else and here are many faults. So the water has to cross the faults in some way. And I guess we're going to come back to this question. You have studied, for example, the, the effects of what would happen to a water transmission main if a fault rupture of this magnitude happens to it. <coughs> mm -hmm. So we'll get to that. Okay. Uh, you've already done studies like that at LADWP. That'll be very interesting to, to hear about. So I'll pose another question, question to Jonathan. How, how close have we come uh, to catastrophic uh, earthquake losses in our history uh, in the state of California, for example? So the, the graphic here shows a number of historic earthquakes. Uh, many of you in the audience have probably experienced several of these and have memories of them. And I think uh, all Californians have a healthy fear uh, and respect for earthquakes. Um, 1906 was a disaster. Uh, you could even say 1906 was a catastrophe. Um, the points that I would like to make have to do with two earthquakes that I think most of us have heard of that were bad. Without any question, they were bad, but they could have been so much worse. And um, these will, I think, uh, surprise some of you how close we came to something being much, much uglier. The first that I'd like to mention is from 1971. If you've ever driven north out of LA on either the 405 or the 5, as you leave the San Fernando Valley going towards Santa Clarita, if you look to your left, there's a big reservoir complex there that is, and water treatment that is uh, owned and operated by the city of Los Angeles, Department of Water and Power, where Craig Davis used to work. Within that was a major reservoir uh, that received the water from uh, Owens Valley in the east. And uh, there were several reservoirs there. One of them was the Lower San Fernando Dam. And this was a dam that was built in the early part of the 20th century. And it was of a loose, uh, it was a loose sandy material, susceptible to what we now understand to be liquefaction. They didn't understand that at the time that it was built. Well, when that earthquake in 1971 struck, there was a landslide in that dam. And the dam slid into the reservoir behind. And you went from a freeboard, which is the distance from the top of the dam to the reservoir level, that was, I think, something like 30 feet as a typical operating level, uh, down to just a few feet. Now, below this reservoir uh, was and is the San Fernando Valley. A lot of people live in the San Fernando Valley. And if that landslide, which lowered the height of the dam by uh, about 30 feet, had lost just a little bit more, even just a slightly bit below the reservoir level, water would have started to trickle over. And very quickly, that water trickling over the top would have eroded a little bit and then a little bit more, and it very quickly cascades into a release. So that that reservoir, which is quite large, would have released into the San Fernando Valley without any control, without warning, a lot of people would have died. This would have been the largest natural disaster in United States history. Um, and we barely avoided it by the narrowest of margins. It was incredibly scary for the profession, and we've been trying to learn lessons from that ever since. We dodged a bullet in San Fernando. Now if we fast forward to 1989, I'll just mention one more. For those of you who are baseball fans, the A's played the Giants in the World Series in 1989. Got through two games just fine, but the third game, the Loma Prieta earthquake struck just as the game was getting going. Uh, so it's forever going to be known as the, as the uh, World Series earthquake. Because it was the World Series and the earthquake happened at 5.04 p.m., um, people didn't go home from work at their normal time. They went home from work early so they could watch the game because it was the A's in Oakland and the Giants in San Francisco, and the earthquake was in the Bay Area. So, of course, 
Everybody was home watching the game. And as a result of that, they were not on the freeway. A freeway collapse, I'm sure you're all aware of this if you follow earthquake uh, situations at all. The, the Cypress structure, which carried traffic from the Bay Bridge to the south. At 5 p.m., you've all been in LA traffic. Are the freeways full? <laughs> <laughs> okay, same thing in the Bay Area. So this freeway would normally be a parking lot at 5 p.m. But there was actually very few people on it. It collapsed, it killed too many people. It was a tragedy. It could have been so much worse. And it was only by the incredible freak of the sports universe that it did not happen. <laughs> <laughs> so we've come very close to disaster. We can't always count on being so lucky. Can I expand on how close? Please do. So there were, the, the, back to the San Fernando Dams, I helped study that with my PhD. Um, but it had 35 feet of freeboard before the earthquake. It had roughly 30 feet of freeboard, which is just a wedge after. So think of a, a dam in the water that slid 200 feet upstream, held the water, but there's just this wedge with water and cracks on the downstream side. It was scheduled at that time to have about another 10 or 15 feet of water in the reservoir. The only reason why it didn't is because we had just finished building the second Los Angeles aqueduct, which was above ground and they had unusual freeze and a new welding technology that we learned first in the world that that welding cannot handle freeze. So it broke the aqueduct. If it hadn't broke the aqueduct because they made a mistake in trying to use new technologies, which is why civil engineers are so conservative, <laughs> We would have filled that reservoir much higher, yeah. and it would have done more than what John said. It wouldn't have trickled over. And depending on the report, either if you understand the LAPD or the LA Fire Department, LAPD, as I recalled, uh, stated that they evacuated 80,000 people out of the inundation zone. And the LA Fire Department said that it was 120,000 people. Either is way too much. So that's how close we were to having somewhere on the order of 100,000 people washed down to the LA River. Mm -hmm. And that's not an acceptable margin of, of error. Mm -hmm. So, but th these things exist and those hazards we believe are out of the way. And, uh, but we, we can get very precariously close to some of these disasters. And with Ridgecrest, even though there was damage in some a lot of damage and a lot of people lost their homes and so on. Imagine the same event in LA, in the population, a very heavily populated area. So it's, uh, it was a, a very sad and difficult event for the residents there, but it could have been way worse too. It's just a matter of location and earthquakes can happen pretty much anywhere. So would they happen on faults, sometimes on some we know, and oftentimes on faults we don't know that are there. So that brings us to the next question, and this is a seismology question that I'd like to ask Ken first. Uh, what would you consider to be the most dangerous faults in California uh, in terms of potential impact on our population and infrastructure? Well, of course, the San Andreas, which is the one in red on the probabilistic seismic hazard map for the state. Uh, and the reason is that this has the highest slip rate. So when uh, paleoseismologists trench through the layer cake stratigraphy, where the San Andreas Fault has cut through those strata in prehistoric and early historic earthquakes, those offsets can then be dated. And also offsets, lateral offsets can be, you know, the time can be measured using radiocarbon. And so we can get the slip rate. Okay, so that information along with geodetic data from the GPS network and seismic data from the seismic network, it all gets combined thanks to the work of the Southern California Earthquake Center, uh, many, many and people. And the USGS. So this uh, <laughs> almost unpronounceable, well, no, I'll tell you, it's pronounced USURF3, uh, and you can see what all those words are in that acronym, um, but this is a large team effort that's been going on for a long time. And here in California, because of these efforts, it's really the cutting edge of research and development on how to do probabilistic seismic hazard assessment here in California. It's a big partnership, too, involving the state agency, the California Geological Survey here, and partly funded also by the state insurance fund, the California Earthquake Authority. 
But yeah, so the San Andreas is the big player. Uh, roughly 35 millimeters of the total plate motion rate of around 50, a little bit more than 50 millimeters a year. So roughly two thirds, three quarters, depending on whether you're in Southern California, Central or Northern California. Um, but now it's not enough to just stop there. And we do look at all the other faults as best we can. We try to prioritize. So in Southern California, the sort of second place, the silver medal winning fault in terms of hazard would be the San Jacinto. And then third place bronze medal would be Elsinore. <laughs> uh, these faults come into the LA basin and are very uh, threatening even though they're lower uh, hazard level. But the Newport Inglewood fault, which goes all the way down to San Diego, the Newport Inglewood Rose Canyon, if that went in a big earthquake like a seven and a half, it could go all at once and that would go LA and San Diego it would be horrendous. Um, uh, and then the Palos Verdes fault as well. Those both threaten the port complex area, Newport Inglewood and Palos Verdes. So I worry about those. And uh, for the, you know, the, the hospital system of Los Angeles, I think uh, you know, we're concerned about the Santa Monica Hollywood system, um, you know, the Sierra Madre fault system along the base of the big mountains on the north side of the San Gabriel Valley. We have a lot of earthquakes, uh, I mean faults here in Southern California that we're concerned about having damaging earthquakes. Not necessarily big magnitude. Uh, the San Andreas historically 1857 as well as 1906 we know produced magnitude 7.8 earthquakes. So uh, in terms of big magnitude we're concerned about that. But fortunately it's on the other side of the San Gabriel Mountains from Los Angeles. Um, we are concerned also about smaller magnitude earthquakes, but much more proximal to Los Angeles. You know, earthquakes like Ridgecrest that could cut right through the urban, urban fabric of Los Angeles with surface rupture, and that's very concerning. In the Bay Area, in addition to the San Andreas, you've got the Hayward Fault, which we did the Haywired scenario on over the last few years. Um, and, you know, in both the Bay Area and in LA, there are so many faults that could cause trouble and even if they have a low slip rate, in the probabilistic framework we're looking at here, they may not show up much, it may not be red, but it still may be a hazard. Mm -hmm. I think maybe with that, you may have something to add, yeah. It, it also depends where you're at specifically. I mean, when I look at my house's location, I worry about Newport Inglewood. When I was a student at UCLA, I worried a lot about the Santa Monica Fault. So. Uh, statewide, I think those faults you mentioned with the very large slip rate, that's truly going to impact a larger area, but even a small event very close to population, the Puente Hills right under downtown, mm -hmm. it goes, it's, you know, even if it's a 6.5, it could have a big impact. So I, they're kind of uh, all interesting and all uh, good potential, uh, you know, destructors but it really depends on, on what, and the San Andreas would affect the water supply to LA while the ones more locally will affect more the distribution. It, it's all a trade-off, I think. Mm -hmm. the, we've got a lot of cool faults and a <laughs> lot of dangerous faults, too. <laughs> yeah. you, you listed like 25 medals. <laughs> <laughs> so well, let us bring ourselves to the present. So we have the hazard map there, and of course on, the, on that map uh, is our infrastructure. And our infrastructure in a variety of conditions. There's the old infrastructure that may have some seismic deficiencies because when we built them, we didn't know really exactly what the, the you know potential damages are and everything. And then we have the brand new structures that we're building, and perhaps some of those structures are built in new ways that we don't fully understand uh, how they will actually react during an earthquake. Uh, I put uh, an example here of uh, that might be interesting to the audience. That's the uh, the tunnel that Elon Musk is building. And I think the city of Los Angeles is in charge of uh, approving or disproving that. <laughs> and I, I think at least one person in this audience have ridden through that tunnel in that car. And that would be Ted Allen right there. I think he's smiling. I don't know if anyone else has uh, driven through that tunnel. But <clears throat> so uh, let me uh, then um, kind of ask this question. Given the current state of our infrastructure, what are the principal threats in the event of a major earthquake in California? Um, kind of thinking about uh, all the non-ductile reinforced concrete buildings that we have uh, that were built before 1974, a lot of the soft story buildings we have, uh, and then a lot of structures that are aging 
uh, like the Sixth uh, Street Viaduct and some of our dams, which have suffered uh, damage without any earthquakes, just kind of under gravity loads. <laughs> right. um, I, we've talked a lot about water and water pipes appropriately, so, but I love sewers, okay? <laughs> I love sewers. In, in Los Angeles, we have 6,500 miles of sewers, uh, a lot of miles. In the North, uh, Northridge earthquake, um, there was about, we, we're out in the valley, we uh, TV'd 2,200 miles. We actually had 220, 10% of it had failures. So, um, you know, lucky uh, for us, um, you know, the breaks were not major. But we've taken that into consideration in our sewer uh, system design. Going over faults now, we're using shorter segments. So if there is shifting, we can do that, double gasketing. So very, very fortunate because obviously if the sewer system breaks, bubbles up, uh, we do flow for the most part downhill in Los Angeles. We live in a big bowl. But, uh, you know, if that starts going out into the river and so forth, we have that public health. You know, as Craig said, he got the water back in 10 days, but if you don't have the sanitary system, mm -hmm. you know, you have another, talk about fires breaking out, you've now got this health, health uh, okay. crisis on your hands. Under uh, our jurisdiction, under my jurisdiction, we have 415 bridges that are responsible. I'm glad to say that we're down to just 12 bridges that are structurally deficient. And so over the last 20 years, we've made a big, big push to upgrade those bridges. So we're hoping uh, with our federal government for about another $100 million to finish those last 12. So for me, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have a comfort level. You know, you say duck cover hold. I, I would say don't stay on the bridge, uh, you know. <laughs> it's always good advice, you know, but if, but if you do have to stay on a bridge, we're building a brand new Sixth Street viaduct uh, over the Los Angeles River, three quarters of a mile long, about a $500 million investment. And on this bridge, uh, we're installing seven foot diameter, triple friction pendulum bearings. Mm -hmm. And uh, boy, they're uh, 30, they can move, the whole bridge will move 30 inches in any one direction. That's, that's mm. what our great structural engineers are telling me. So we're a couple years away from completing that, but as I, you talk about uh, engineering marvel, I just, I look at those uh, uh, bearings and I'm just amazed. Uh, and the last one I would just show it is cost. Um, many people voted uh, for, uh, in 20 years ago, what was called Prop G, and you invested in doing the seismic upgrades in LA. <laughs> we're designing a new building by City Hall 750,000 square foot building, 27 stories. And one of the things, public works will be in the building. I'll be going to city council <coughs> next year and asking them, or I'll be recommending that we make it a, a base isolated building because they say police and fire are there the first day, the second day, but after that, public works is the one that's gotta come in, clean up the streets and so forth. If we don't have the ability to operate, we're in big trouble. So the question is, do you want to spend $44 million on base isolating? So it doesn't come, so cost always factors into this whole scenario. So I just bring that in as um, it, the resiliency does, does come with a price tag. Um, so let me pose the next question to, uh, to Christine. Um, given the current state of our infrastructure overall, what are the principal threats in your mind uh, in the event of a major earthquake in Southern California? So I'm not sure it's principal threats, but following up on what Gary said, I think that we have a big issue with systems, thinking of our whole cities as a system. And I'm gonna use the example of a hospital, right? You might have a hospital that's maybe on base isolation. There's a lot of shaking, it's fine, structurally fine, and all that functions, but oh, there's no power, no power grid. Or, um, or you, uh, you lose your water connection because the ground and the building don't move quite at the same rate and you break the pipes. Oh yeah, okay, you can have a generator, you have some water reserves, but if it's a major break on San Andreas, it could take weeks, months, uh, months before we have water again. So all those things are really important. Another one is what if the roads or the bridges are damaged and your trauma surgeon cannot drive to work and the uh, nurses cannot come in. So when you start to think about having a hospital, for example, functional, you require all the infrastructure and the interconnections they have between them to work. And that's a place where 
we really need to invest a lot of more time in research because you can make one component really strong or resilient as a component, but it's the system as a whole. Now scale that up to a whole city. So I think this is the kind of problems that uh, we really need to think about. It requires a lot of uh, multidisciplinary groups and uh, it's interesting because some of us have developed proposals <laughs> along those lines, but these things are really important and, and to me it's a threat if we just look at, look at a single system in isolation. Yeah, I think uh, the tendency in the past few decades among engineers has been the siloed approach where everybody would study their own hazard and own kind own of building own risks and you know landslides, liquefaction, reinforced concrete buildings. But these interdependencies have come to the forefront now, and a lot more people are looking at those things. I'm trying to see Henry Burton here if he's there still. Yeah, but he stepped you know, out. So some of our faculty are specifically focusing on those topics. So um, what measures are being taken to improve our infrastructure to reduce these threats um, is my next question. And let me ask uh, this to Craig. Okay, um, it's a nice tag on to what Christine was talking about. Um, going back to my first question about what is resilience, maybe something I didn't emphasize enough is what Christine was talking about. It, it really is understanding how the big picture of systems of systems work together, and then uh, how do you design in each component of a system, each bridge, each roadway, each pipeline, each pumping station, all of that, each building, <coughs> and how does that all fit together, which includes hospital buildings mm -hmm. and all of the buildings that have to support the hospital, right? So uh, that's a medical system. Right? So that's the way we need to think, and how do you get the water to and the power to the hospital, and how do you get the sewage away from the hospital so the hospital can work, right? It requires all of these systems to work together. So thank you for bringing that up because that's probably one of the most important measures. So what are the measures being taken to reduce these threats? Well, you've heard of some. Gary talked nicely about a number of them. Um, there's, there's a number of things going on. I can speak mostly about the LA water system, so that's what since ET threw out nice water pitchers, that's what I'll take advantage of. But um, there, there's uh, a number of innovative things going on. So one, you, you see above my head a new logo. There's a logo. Yeah, it goes slowly. Okay, so there's a logo over here that represents a, a, something that the mayor, Eric, uh, our mayor, Eric Garcetti, well, I live in Santa Clarita, but it was my mayor. I live in Santa Clarita. <laughs> uh, our mayor, Eric Garcetti, uh, created this, this uh, prior to the resilience program that Marissa was resilience by design, which uh, was developed by Dr. Lucy Jones with the mayor's office, and took a recommendation that I was able to make to create a seismic resilient water supply network or um, program. And what that is, it's a task force, actually. So that's the LA Department of Water and Power working with the Metropolitan Water District, working with the California Department of Water Resources as equals, even though they're tiered state, region, city, as equals to work as one unit to not look at the three different aqueducts as a system by itself, but all of them together as a regional system so that we can have greater opportunity to bring water after a major San Andreas event that can damage all of them at once. How do we work together to bring water in as fast as possible through any one of those. Uh, and, and so that's a very successful program that continues. And also we're looking at how to do mitigations on these aqueducts uh, for near term and for long term interties. We're doing things, th this proceeds down to other, uh, yes. to other slides. You can right? click, that's yeah. Right. Is that the right way? Uh, it should be. Mm -hmm. the no. Oh, it's the other way. We're going in the past. Yeah, there so, mm -hmm. so we have the, uh, as an example, we have the Elizabeth Tunnel, which is part of the uh, first and second Los Angeles aqueducts that springs down uh, water for the city of LA to use. It crosses in a five mile long tunnel, but halfway through there at about two and a half miles, you see the San Andreas Fault crossing the tunnel nearly perpendicular. Well, the USGS says that that can move anywhere from a few inches when it ruptures at that location to several meters, so maybe even up to 30 feet. It's a nine foot wide tunnel if you can see the cross section. So one thing that we're doing is trying to, uh, so it'll get offset and then uh, if it moves only say five of those nine feet, 
the tunnel will probably collapse, but we're, we have pl a project plan to put uh, a ductile high density polyethylene pipe to protect a void space to allow the water to continue through, which might be the only water after a major San Andreas event that we could get to the city of Los Angeles and actually all of Southern California as far as imported water. But you know, if it moves nine feet, it'll start squeezing it. Maybe it'll work a little bit. If it moves the full 30 feet, that's not the solution. <laughs> right? So we're looking at other things. What can we do by having inner ties and increase being resilient? How can you withstand the and understand our hazards, deal with it relative to the infrastructure and its vulnerabilities and the constraints, be able to pay for costly improvements uh, that are cost effective and valuable to the constituents, which are probably most of you. Um, so, there's, so that's an example of a collapsed tunnel. And then we're working on importing and creating new uh, resilient technologies. The LA Department of Water and Power spearheaded this for across the world, uh, second to Japan, but mm -hmm. we were the first to import uh, very fancy pipes out of Japan, anywhere in the world. We're the first to be installing those to create a seismic resilient pipe network. The seismic resilient pipe network is, uh, think, think of it as, you know, we have 7,000 miles, so similar to the number of sewer miles, sewer pipe miles, we have 7,000 miles of pipe laid out in pr virtually every street. So we can't protect every one of those, so we can't prevent water losses, but we can put them in strategic locations in a grid so that when they're damaged, we can isolate those that are most important. How many of you would like to see the hospitals get water before the industrial plants. <laughs> okay, right now we can't do that. If a hospital and an industrial plant are in the same pressure zone, no matter how large it is, it's the same. But we can redesign and rethink our systems to be resilient so that we can get water to that hospital. And of course, anybody that lives around it would also benefit from that. But we can get the water to the hospitals, we can focus on that. And uh, so think of a, think of a fish net the grid, the street blocks, with only, we can only afford to reinforce some of those. The big fish comes in, a shark, <laughs> hits that, breaks all the weak ones, but it couldn't get through the strong ones. It's resilient, it can handle that. So now you can actually protect whatever you wanted on the other side from this net. You remove the fish, you repair the weaker parts over time, and you get the net back working the way it was before. So maybe a way to visualize what we're trying to do. And not only are we importing it from Japan, but we're leading the testing and creating new uh, products. We've actually been able to create a seismic resilient uh, uh, pipe, a self-sustaining seismic resilient pipe industry throughout this country that's not only resilient for earthquakes, but it's resilient for all types of hazards. And um, here's some examples of LADWP installing that. Uh, just examples of the, the network here where we've actually laid it out. So this is a real thing. It's being laid out and being installed by the LA Department of Water and Power. And I'm taking uh, his thunder. But it's not just for water. I just know mostly about that. But I can tell you some other things that are going on, like for climate change. Um, between LA and San Diego, a, um, a railway has been retrofitted to be able to, they don't know what the future inundation from sea level rise will be. They've taken their best guess. They've built a cost-effective railway, and, but if they're wrong, because there's a huge uncertainty there, they've taken the mean, but they, they, they've taken into the possibility of what if we're wrong. They've actually built into it a very inexpensive way to be able to slowly raise that over time and be able to continually use that railway with limited outage time in the future if the sea level causes more problems or, or maybe more erosion without a higher level, but there's, there's things that can happen. So there's very innovative thinking that's going into how do we deal with resilience in these networks as a whole. So thank you. Thank you. So um, I have lost a little bit of track of time. So, so yeah. Oh, yeah. So I think uh, I will just pose this last question to our panel and then move on to Q&A. Uh, the last question is uh, what measures are not currently being pursued but are needed? So if you have any input on that. Um. I know. <laughs> <He's good. laughs> so one of them was already brought up, but it, it is uh, the, the dependencies on the systems. It's so complicated. Yeah. 
you know, uh, that I think Christine, several people have mentioned that before, but you can't emphasize enough the need to better understand how complicated these systems are and how interdependent. There's dependencies like uh, you can't pump water if you don't have power, so a direct dependency. And then there's interdependencies. Maybe that power needs to be generated from hydropower. Right, so so you need one working on the other. Sometimes there's a dependency, sometimes there, and, and these permeate throughout. There, the the hospital networks need to be uh, useful to even have the staff to respond. Right, so the, there's all these social and economic and infrastructure interdependencies. Uh, it's not being it's, it's being thought about, but it's not really being accounted for. Um, how these damage, how damages and losses from any type of event actually translates to services, right? So I mentioned that services is the easiest way to understand resilience. That was part of my first response. But what we really don't understand is when you have these really complicated networks that have these interdependencies, when they're damaged, how do we actually estimate with good accuracy what's good enough to be resilient? So what is a good enough seismic resilient pipe network, right? So I told you we're going to lay it out on a grid. I didn't tell you what the grid size was because we actually don't know yet. We have our gas, but further work is necessary to understand how to make it as resilient as we need it to be for, for, so that you could get the water when you need it. Um, performance goals and all of these things. We need performance goals. And right now what we have is every individual creating their own performance goals completely independent of the other. And it's not just the individuals. So you have agencies doing that. You have individuals within the agency, because there's no policy on these at the agency's level. There's no policy at the city level. So all of these things are going independent. So you might have a bridge designed to a different level than the water system, and they're expected to actually work together. But one of them will fail before the other. Right? So we're not doing a good job of that yet. It is being thought about. It is being researched. But when I say we're not doing a good job, that's in practice, because we actually don't know how yet. The, the, mm -hmm. These are my thoughts on what we're not getting done. Yeah, let, let me just add something in the building domain. Um, we often hear the term earthquake proof used in connection with buildings. So if you have a building, say your home or your place of work, and it was built in the last uh, few years, few decades maybe, it was built to the building code. And if it's built to the building code, I think most people would assume that it's earthquake proof or at least earthquake resilient. The public doesn't appreciate the fact that the building code is a minimum standard which is only intended to not kill you. That is the goal. If the building is destroyed but nobody dies, that is actually success according to the building code. The reason it was done that way is back when they started writing building codes, earthquakes were this horribly uncertain thing. We didn't really know what we were doing and just not killing anybody was a pretty noble objective. We have learned a lot more now. And so I think the question we're starting to ask ourselves with buildings and lots of other things is maybe we should be aiming a little bit higher. Maybe we should be thinking about buildings not just avoiding killing people, but being usable after a certain amount of time. Now, if you leave it to the typical developer, they will go for the absolute minimum standard because they're gonna build it, they're gonna sell it, they're gonna move on. So if you leave it up to private industry, with a few exceptions, you will not get to the resilience that society would probably decide we need. So there are some discussions going on. This actually gets into the political domain uh, of public policy and uh, would, would uh, Sacramento and others support it. But should we be rethinking the building code to enforce a higher level of performance so that our structures are in fact useful after design earthquakes? We're not doing that yet. That building code does not exist. Uh, but I think that's part of where we need to go. Yeah, we actually had a segment devoted to that uh, using uh, the Christchurch uh, earthquake in New Zealand as an example, which is what they really fully realized that they should mm -hmm. be aiming a higher standard. And I think they're kind of making more moves towards that. So with that, let's just turn to the audience and then have their questions. Years ago, there was. Years ago, there was a theory that you could pump water along the fault lines, the major fault lines, and cause many small slips to avoid a major slip. And I haven't heard about that 
in a long time. What happened to that theory, and is it still valid? Uh, I can take a crack at that, but um, this this a <laughs> take a crack at no that. No pun in there. Um, yes, I, I'm usually very good at bad puns, and this one I didn't even realize because it was good. But uh, this goes. I, I want to address that because it goes along with the myth that people say, "Oh, we've had a lot of small earthquakes like lately, so therefore there's not going to be a large earthquake." And so, in order for this theory to work, you need to you need to really have. I mean thousands and thousands of earthquakes to, of a magnitude seven to match a magnitude seven, and it needs to be on the exact same fault plane that's gonna rupture in, in the future. So I'm not aware of this specific idea I've, and I've experiment, but I've heard about it, but I, I'm, I don't know the details, but to me, it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense, and it, it, there's also a lot, a lot of misconception in the public. Well, we've had a lot of earthquakes, therefore, you know, it took all the energy out of the system, we won't get a big one. Or other people say, oh, there's been a lot of earthquakes, so sure, there's gonna be a big one now. All these things are, are not as simple as that, and there's a counterbalancing between, you know, what we call the, uh, elastic rebound and triggering effects and all that. But the short answer is that I wouldn't invest a lot of money in that. The, the way I look at this is that we know there's going to be earthquakes. They're going to happen. Let us do better designs, given that we'll have earthquakes. And I think it's a, probably a safer bet. And I think that's what this group and others in the audience are trying to do. To me, it makes a lot more sense. R related to that is the concept in earthquake seismology that they know more about what causes an earthquake than what stops the earthquake. So you. They don't know why a magnitude three doesn't become a magnitude seven, but they know why they can get a magnitude three. So do, part of that conversation, because I've heard these things over my career, do you want to be the person that created the magnitude seven because you were putting the water in? Now you would say that it's going to happen at some point, but now you can actually pinpoint who caused that earthquake if this theory were actually be implemented. That was actually part of the discussion as well. Yes, and there was some scientific observation from oil wells that certain oil wells were drilled in certain areas that uh, the earthquakes uh, occurred more frequently and less uh, lesser magnitude. So, it's a big it's a big issue in Oklahoma right now, and it's a combination of two factors, and most of it is uh, deep well injection. So they use fracking, so they inject fluid to uh, to to fracture the shale and extract oil. And after that, the contaminated water, the, the water, they just inject that in the wells back in. And you can see with uh, the aggregated published industry data and the seismicity, these things are related. There was no earthquakes in Oklahoma before you know, the, the boom of, uh, of oil came again to, to exploit uh, the gas in that area. So you could see like, whew, big increase in the seismicity. And some of those were pretty large in Texas. It was a 5.4. A 5.4 in Texas, there was damage there. A lot of structures were damaged. So definitely, I think playing around <laughs> and injecting fluids without fully understanding what it can do is a big issue. And more and more, the oil industry is investing. They don't share the data, usually uh, unless it's per regulation, but they invest a lot in instrumentation to make sure that they don't inject a certain volume over a certain time to not trigger those big earthquakes and they monitor the seismicity very carefully so as to not trigger something they have no control over. That's, that's a big issue currently, a lot of seismicity uh, in the central eastern U.S. and Canada. Yes, sir, a lot of uh, data and Cleveland and Ohio and other yep. Midwestern states where fracking is going on and it's pretty predictable what happens. Uh, they pump the oil and water out and then they have to pump the water back in again. And so I think there's a lot of data, a lot of information available from the experimental observations of what is actually going on. Mm -hmm. So the only excuse that I heard at the time was that nobody would dare do it because they couldn't withstand the liability that might occur if something did happen that wasn't predicted and would be blamed on the state for doing these kinds of earthquake inventions. So I want to pick up on something that Gary mentioned earlier, and that's use of technology, um, specifically the LA Shake app, and now the state's rolled out an app that gives you, depending if it's a Newport Inglewood, no time, but San Andreas gives you several seconds to, uh, you know, 
stop, drop, drop, and hold on. Uh, but more importantly, what is it? Is there any thoughts of our infrastructure as far as locking down things, automatic uh, gates, or something like that to stop flows? Has there been discussions about that with the, any of the agencies? You can maybe take that. So, uh, one of the printed materials available out on the registration tables is about the Shake Alert Earthquake Early Warning System. So, we have had uh, one partnership arrangement that resulted in development of an interface to a SCADA controlled valve that's been successful. So what I think would be very interesting to pursue um, in future work would be how to make decisions about whether to open or shut the valve. So the shake alert system for earthquake early warning is now up and running. The governor just announced statewide application recently. And here in LA, the mayor had recently announced uh, shake alert LA. So it's coming along and USGS is working here in Southern California primarily with Caltech and in Northern California primarily with UC Berkeley, also in Seattle with UW for the Pacific Northwest. So the Western United States are going to be um, protected essentially by an earthquake early warning. The public rollout for California has already occurred and soon will follow Oregon, Washington. Um, so as the system is progressing, we recognize that parts of it need additional thought and work. And I think uh, for this group, in particular the Risk Institute here and, and others, maybe some of you in the audience will want to tackle this. Uh, imagine, so what this system does now is it takes information from our network of sensors that's telemetered back to where our offices are at Caltech. The data are then automatically processed to get information about the earthquake as it is beginning to occur. So the closest sensors detect it, and then we speed the message information back to our center where we compute location magnitude of the earthquake as it's growing, and then <coughs> second by second we update the information at the locations of the users that have the app on their smartphone, for example, or on their computer. So this is done as best we can with the current technology and it's up and running now. Um, we've demonstrated uh, operation of a valve automatically, but there is so much potential to do so much more. And I think there's interest here from UCLA. We know, I don't know if Ray, if you're in the audience here, but we're gonna be talking more with uh, people here that are responsible for the new system. That's like the PA system, the towers along the walkways so that people can get an alert when there's incoming shaking before it hits UCLA campus, before the strong shaking hits. Uh, so this is, you know, it's got potential. And uh, the integration with automated systems, like I said, we've demonstrated, but a lot more work is needed. I was just going to add, uh, in our new building design for our new high-rise, we're talking about seismic monitoring um, sensors um, so that we get a baseline, and then after the quake happens, you can, you know, uh, get, find out if every, anything moved and where you're at. So once again, it's not the shutting down the valve uh, before, but it's the opportunity to look after so you can feel uh, you know, uh, that the building can be occupied because inspections take a long time, especially uh, in large buildings. Was a question here? So um, you were saying that currently the building codes aim to prevent collapse in a structure. But my question is when you have, um, if you have multiple large magnitude earthquakes, how does the building code account for it? Because <laughs> like we're accepting structural damage, so I'm just wondering if that could propagate into an eventual collapse during a second large event. Yeah, it, yeah. it doesn't really deal with that, so um, it, it <laughs> We're trying to survive the quote unquote design or maximum considered earthquake when it happens. Uh, the probability of an earthquake of that size happening again for the same building is low enough that society is willing to bear the risk that that subsequent earthquake would then bring the building down. But the other way to look at it is the probability of a smaller earthquake that could still produce decent sized shaking that would be shorter in duration is very high. In fact, it's a certainty. Those are called aftershocks, right? And so once you've weakened a building and then you keep exposing it to modest levels of shaking, to what extent does that increase the risk and maybe that brings buildings down? Uh, there are case histories where this type of thing has happened. 
so that's not part of the building code, I can tell you. Um, but it is something that um, entities, there is some technologies available to assess what that risk is and bring it in, but it's not part of the building code. I'd like to add a clarification. So sometimes people, you will hear people say, oh, this building has been designed for a magnitude seven. That's not how it works. A building is designed based on a ground motion level that includes the events around you, the magnitudes and the, all the, the things, including the site conditions of your site, uh, where you're at and all that. And this is translated to a ground motion level. Sometimes it can be associated, if you're right on the San Andreas, it's, <laughs> it's probably going to be designed with something like a large upper seven and so on, but it's still going to be translated into a ground motion value. And I think there's a big a misconception also from the public. You know, beyond like it's earthquake proof or it's, it's designed to sustain a seven. Yeah, a seven, 200 miles away, yeah, all the buildings are fine. You know, so that's, you have to think about that. So it's a ground motion level. I guess, yeah. I guess the thing I would add is, I hope that there's not a catastrophe that results in this. I hope that things like this result in the upgrades of the building code. You know, in Japan, mm -hmm. they have advertisements on TV about uh, base isolation. I don't think on any station here in Los Angeles we see that yet, right? <laughs> so, I mean, um, I'm, I continue to have great hope that people will invest because uh, it, that we don't have that dam that breaks, that you lose hundreds of thousands of people and then everybody all of a sudden decides. So uh, I, I have great hope that we'll all push very strongly to, to do even greater and... Uh, make those investments. So that's that brings in actually the idea of doing uh, scenario simulations as, as Ken mentioned in you and it's, that's one thing we do a lot and, and we do ground motion simulations but then big initiatives like ShakeOut, it's not just a drop cover and hold on, it was meant, all of you published as part of that, especially uh, Craig on what would happen if the ShakeOut happened to the water system and all that. So these, um, potentially real events that are not picked to be the worst case scenario, like the haywired and so on, then it's propagated through what if this happened? And it gives a sense to the, the elected officials and all that and, and policymakers of what we would need to do to prevent what would happen. And none of those are ever picked as this is the worst case scenario. It's something plausible that could happen. And I think exercises like that really beat <laughs> you know, us waiting to see it. And I, I think, but we have to take the, the consequences and what we learn from these studies and really do something about it. Because just saying we're gonna lose water for six months is not, an, it's not a, a decent answer. You need to do something afterwards. So let's take one more question and then. <laughs> David. <laughs> so this question is to Dr. Craig Davis. In the one of the earlier slides, you had a graph of recovery time. Mm -hmm. Can you explain why some of the, well, actually, I think it was the performance dropped after a few days, and then it went back up, whereas everything else went That was the water quality. Mm. So, yeah. I didn't bring that up. You're extremely observant. <laughs> <laughs> So if I may, I can't see that here, so I'm gonna stand up. So, so what, what I'm doing, I, I was asked to make this simple, and you're gonna make it a little more complicated. So I just talked about how the total service is, you turn on your tap, you get what you had before the earthquake. But you actually can break this down into, you have no water, so now you can turn on the tap, you can get water, but it's not of pressure or quality, right? That's, that's delivery then you can, get a, you can build up the quantity, meaning that you can get the volume and the pressure that you had before. Then you can also get the water back for the fire department to use. And then there's another service, that uh, a basic service category that I call water quality. So what happened is these are plots. These are actual plots of measurements from the Northridge earthquake. And immediately after the earthquake, they put out what the state requests us to use is called a boil water notice. Now, by the way, you probably don't boil your water. You probably put an iodine tablet in it or just get bottled water. But they want to call it a boil water notice. It should be a water purification notice, my pet peeve. But that's, thank you for allowing me to say that. <laughs> and, and, and so because of policy, we didn't know at the time how it was affected. We didn't have all these technologies that we have now, and it might not look this way. They put in a full 
boil water notice across the city. So even though some people had good potable water, they didn't believe they did because we told them they didn't. So it goes all the way down. That's across the city. Then we learned where the earthquake had affected the most, and they said, all right, well, looks like only half of the city has a problem. But then they realized they had more damage in the Santa Monica area, actually here, than down to the airport where there wasn't good water quality. So they had made a mistake and they over projected the amount of people that they relieved the boil water notice. So we reinstated it, which means that now more people don't have good water quality, even though they thought they did, right? So it, it, this is basically a tracking of the policy. Mm. And you don't ever want it to go down if you can prevent it. So Marty Adams, uh, some of our good friends, he, <laughs> he, he really learned from that because he was in charge of operating it. He says, you know, Craig, that's something we never want. And so back. I learned that lesson from internal uh, management. Does that answer your question? OK. So with that, uh, let me close the panel by first thanking uh, Ronald and Valerie Sugar for making this gathering possible and our panelists for sharing their knowledge and uh, ideas with, with us and also the audience for coming to join us here tonight. So with that, let's just close the panel. Thank you very much. <laughs>